in 1995, it wasn't so much reflective practice, it was actually when he said that we never need a new epistemology, a new scholarship to teach. So I tried to work uh, throughout my own research and trying to see what that meant in terms of developing a new epistemology. I'm hoping that uh, you know, we really can engage with some of the things I can show you, because I've got a presentation. Uh, it can be on the web tomorrow, so I'll show you where you can access it from my site called actionresearch.net. And what I'm really fascinated about, just in relation to the presentation, is how we might be able to create a new epistemology for education and educational research from the expression of our ontological values. So this idea that in here and now, I'm expressing something that actually gives meaning and purpose to my own existence. But if you see with my students, I really do often say, well, I'm loving what I do. And the fact that I've been coming here 33 years, there's some indication that I've sustained a commitment to educational research in that sense of loving what I do with a certain kind of passion. I also have a commitment to academic freedom and certain areas of social justice, and I hope that this is being expressed through the energy of my body. Okay, so. In relation to philosophical terms, and when I started my philosophy in the British Analytics Group with Peterson Hurst, there was no way they were going to take in my questions that I was asking in East End of London, which was how do I improve my practice? Because what they were interested in was the abstract concept person. So any I, living I, a real educator, was removed from their philosophy as they considered various cases to demonstrate that educational theory was made up of the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history. So that was their view of educational theory. And to a large extent around the world, I'm still seeing that view of educational theory uh, put forward. Okay, so what I'm hoping today is that what we might just be able to do is look at um, a different sense of an educational theory, which, for example, I think I've been generating throughout my whole life in education and educational research, which is an explanation of my educational influence in my own learning, the learning of others, and in the learning of the social formations in which I live and work. So it's not just got the I, it's got the we, and it's also got the social. Okay, so that's what I just want to put forward to you. And I want to show you where, first of all, you can access this. If you're going to um, actionresearch.net, <coughs> I'll just see if I can bring that up for you. Let's just have a look. Now, my website, actionresearch.net, has anybody uh, accessed this here or not? Just one or two. Oh, four or five, okay, four or five, six. If you go in here, by uh, tomorrow, the presentation that I'll show you in a minute will be here, so you can actually access it. Now, I've got no illusion of what, within a 30 minute presentation, I can actually communicate of the weeks of preparation that goes into the bureau presentation, the paper, the paper. So, what I'm hoping is that you'll access this and then perhaps join the global dialogue which is going on from here which is the Practitioner Researcher e-form. I've been working on this now, it's, it's been going about six years. Um, next week was the World Congress of Actual Learning and Actual Research in Australia, and I've been convening um, the Education and Learning Virtual Networking Strand. And you can access what's been going on in those global dialogues from that Practitioner Researcher, and just access, uh, on a month by month basis, the dialogues that have been going on. And you could offer a critique of my own presentation here, uh, using that forum. But it, it's just something that enables us to take on what is presented here and actually then engage with it. And as I say, it will be here tomorrow. And then if you wish, you could respond in that practitioner researcher forum <coughs> to actually critique it, to offer new ideas. Um, now before I start, I'm just curious with audiences. <laughs> because in 1977, some of you may know, I, I, my first presentation, Vera, and it was actually about shares before practice. It was all about work I've done with six teachers over two years. And I attracted an audience of one. Mm -hmm. I told Tati, you know, three minutes. And then he told me it was all in the stem house. And perhaps, <laughs> you know, perhaps I could develop my sense of audience. Now, I've never forgotten that. And so what I'd like to do with audiences is um, just ask, how you come with any kind of questions or inquiries that you personally are curious about? Because I often find that in that kind of dialogue, we get a lot more meaning expressed. I always like to just say to all of us, well, look, how do you actually come here? We've got another 25 minutes. Um, how do you come with something that you're feeling, yeah, this was interesting to me, this is why I'm here. Uh, can I talk about this now so I can respond? And I'll just pause, yes? Oh. I'm, I'm here because um, 
for the past PhD and I'm a graduate student in the Oxford. <laughs> and I find it very quickly, deeply, personally. Do you know which one that was? Yeah, yeah. Madeline Chow. Oh, Madeline, yeah. It's just that if you want to have a look at what I've been doing, um, you know, whilst I've been at the University of Bath, for example, um, and I'm having a little hope, but if you go to this living theory section of my website, um, you'll be able to access all of the doctors that I've supervised in all of the past uh, about 15 years. I don't know what your um, success rate is, but mine are two a year over the last 15 years, so there's 30 of them. Um, it's pretty good in relation to my colleagues. You know, if you say about successfully uh, submitted doctoral theses, you'll be able to get 30 out of them up here, including some masters, which are all of the kind that I'm now talking about. Individuals bringing their embodied knowledge as educators into the academy for legitimation with questions of the kind, how do I improve what I'm doing? Now, that was unusual 20, 30 years ago. You know, Kingston University would write to their researchers and were employing me to as a consultant, but the research committee was made up of uh, scientists and uh, engineers. And uh, there's a letter which asks this head teacher to remove the personal pronoun from the title of her action research. Now, how do you take an eye out of an action research plan? Now, they were meant to look rather foolish, and they had to accept that, that teacher could do it, but that's the state of some of the thinking. Okay, so, yeah, that model is it's really lovely. Uh, you'll be able to access all of them here. You just click on, I, I do recommend this one of Eden Charles, it's brilliant, about Ubuntu. He's Afro-Caribbean, and this notion in South Africa of Ubuntu, but I am because we are. It's a lovely relational, uh, epistemological standard of judgment as well as we are being. And you can access this uh, here. He brought Ubuntu as a living standard of judgment into the academy. And that's philosophers, it would be really helpful to reflect on that and to see epistemologically do you agree that these ontological values, the values that I hope I'm expressing now with you, can be brought into a claim to educational knowledge and be legitimated in the academy? I, do I make sense there philosophically? Because this is really important because this is a philosophy of education centre. Um, so I'm really pleased that you access that in terms of money. Any others that you're feeling, yes, I came here and I'd like very much, you know, just to make sure that this is tackled in the course of um, this presentation. Because this is what it's on. I mean, it's about creating an educational epistemology in the multimedia narratives of living educational theories and living theory methodologies. So, can I just pause again? You've got that one, Marlene, so that's a real delight to you know, be in the for that. That's great. Any others? Or not? Um, at the end of 10 years, just got my doctorate, and I came up with an emotional theory of learning in addition. And I find that looking back, I probably be doing something of what you that's very, very practitioner based. And, and so you I'm, now do. I'm noticing that I've sort of found my home in a way. Yeah. In your area. I, I think that's you know most important. So you'll see in my presentation uh, that there's a video, a particular video And this is from Maria Naidu's doctorate. And Marion brought a passion for compassion, passion for compassion as a standard of judgment into her thesis. So that sense of the emotion. If I just play this, and let's go about a minute, I, I think we'll see from my paper something about the ontological values that I'm saying we need to actually acknowledge, recognize, and bring explicitly into our accounts. Now this context here, uh, there's the uh, Alzheimer's patient. Here's the husband, Karen, and we've been married about 50 years. And he's talking about his life as a carer. His wife, Marion, is just sitting there at the beginning as, uh, when George is speaking. Now, George is speaking very quickly, but I want to just show you the use of some of the videos. Your ethical permissions have been granted from George in relation to this. But it's, and I think that I should, and we've been there for 55 years, and so I'm wrapping my own way. The transition period was very hard, and so I had to change my way of life. It's not my right to say that I was a really patient person. Okay, now, just at the moment, you see Marion. Now, this is one of the things that I just want to show you with quick time. And it's a technique that I've been referring to in relation to empathetic resonance. And it builds on with Marion Dazza's work on empathetic validity. Because notions of validity and rigor are really important in this research. Now, one of the ways I've used empathetic validity is like this. If you've got the video clip, and you can move your cursor over like this, you can cover 
an hour in a very short space of time. Now, there is Marion. And remember, she's been videotaped by Marion Naidu, the doctoral researcher. Now, at this moment, suddenly, Marion starts to come to listen to what husband George is saying. And the movement here, I think, is unmistakable. Okay? Now, that moment there, Marion looking directly at Marion. Marion, in terms of the context, and she's got the husband George talking about all his life as a carer. Marion is in the direct gaze of Marion, and there she is saying, look, it's at that moment that I felt the energy of this passion for compassion, which is at the heart of my doctoral thesis. Now, the examiners, who were unused to this kind of form of representation, were convinced by Marion's both text, the visual narrative, and the video, to say, yes, she had convincingly shown in a public and communicable way that can be tested for validity, her claim to be bringing her passion for compassion as a form of a standard of judgment into the academy. I, I, I'm sure that, that, in terms of that sense of the emotion, which is right at the heart of some of these new living standards, is, I have a thought appeal in terms of what you were saying. Yeah? I, I'm okay with this, just come in if you like, in terms of this form of representation, which is now me in the here and now expressing my values with you, with an energy that I only feel. Yet how many of us put into our written accounts anything which gets close to the passion that I'm feeling at the moment for what I'm saying? And yet any explanation of my influence, if it omits this energy and the genuine love that I've had for education on the life I was working with, omits something very significant indeed from the explanation. And it was certainly missing from the philosophers that I studied, even though I got a lot from British analytic philosophy. But they actually completely mistook the nature of educational theory. They were completely mistaken. And then Hurst in 83 acknowledged the mistake. I don't know if you remember this, but he said that um, what he was viewing when I was studying with them in 68, 69, that the values and principles I'm expressing now were at best in their words, pragmatic maxims, which only had a first crude and superficial justification practice that would be replaced in any rationally developed theory. Okay, that was their view. 83 acknowledged a mistake. We think the damage that was done from 68 to 83, actually denying the validity of the embodied knowledge of the educators who came to study philosophy of education. Now, it's something around this area that I'm saying, I do think. We've got a lot of work to do to bring these ontological expressions of value and energy into the public domain and as philosophers to actually <coughs> show that they can come into the knowledge place. Let me just, just pause again now and just say, is there anything that we feel that we want to just respond to? Can I ask, uh, Jack, so are you saying that you're taking, are you taking, say, concepts and making them come alive through your own processes of conceptualization? Yeah, yeah. And, but, the difference is this, if you start with concepts in the British tradition, which is understanding a principle and the ability in their words to use words correctly, okay? Now, if you don't start with that, but recognize historically and culturally, we're all under pressure to conform to that notion of concept. It goes back to Aristotelian logic at two and a half thousand years ago, eliminate contradictions from correct thought. You know, the, the dialecticians know contradictions at the heart of correct thought. What I'm suggesting is that if we will, again, in it is a form of reflection, but it's not a reflection, for example, on the work of Foucault, although I, I really enjoy Foucault's work and draw on it. It's not going to uh, Rorty's conceptuality, and again, I really enjoy Rorty on you know, irony, uh, irony and contingency. It's saying, look, in your relationships with your students, or education, I think you will be expressing the call it, life affirming energy that you know helps to give meaning and purpose to your existence. So if you just hold that for a moment. And it is being expressed. I'm feeling, I'm expressing that in the here and now. And I'm using words as well to try to communicate my meaning. But the meaning is not just within the concepts of my language. That is vital this in terms of understanding what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that to get to a passion for compassion, that look there, of Marius, and then when she does that with the hands, just to communicate, 